Well, it was another slow start for the Gonzaga Bulldogs, who were carried to victory by Drew Timmy and the bench against Northern Illinois. It makes us wonder if Mark Few needs to consider shaking up the starting lineup. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you daily reports through another season of Gonzaga Hoops. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by Sling TV. Don't miss this week's matchup between Gonzaga and Alabama right here on Sling. Sling, the TV you love for a price you'll love. Try it today. All right, well, the Zags... It looks like on paper, at least coasted to an easy 19-point victory over the Northern Illinois Huskies, a team ranked well outside of the top 300 per Ken Palm's rankings. Folks who watch the game know it wasn't quite as easy as it looked. That has been an unfortunate theme of the season for the Gonzaga Bulldogs. I have used the word frustrating probably more times this season than I have ever used in my three years of covering Gonzaga as a podcaster. Uh, And that has kind of been the theme and it continued here. They were only up six points at halftime against a team that frankly, they didn't have any business letting hang around in this game. We have seen Gonzaga continually come out with slow starts and obviously the, the, ridiculous non-conference schedule and the fact that they were playing very few home games was used as a bit of a crutch. Uh, And there is an element of truth to that. This is a ridiculous non-conference schedule that Gonzaga has played. Many of the players had to adjust to new roles or new teams entirely while playing a schedule that was unprecedented in Gonzaga's history. But that's not the stretch of games we're in right now. Last three games, Kent State, a good quality program, an NCAA tournament team. Washington, probably not an NCAA tournament team. Northern Illinois, absolutely not an NCAA tournament team. And again, the Zags went 3-0 and in that stretch, and none of the games by the end appeared particularly close, but they have not really blown a team out, at least not in the way that we are used to seeing them do. Now, I want to focus a little bit on some of the good things that happened in this game, and of course, you got to start with your National Player of the Year candidate. Maybe not the front runner anymore, thanks to Zach Eady at Purdue, but Drew Timmy is doing enough work to keep himself in that conversation. 26 points on 9 of 15 shooting in this game. The best, best stat from this game for the Zags entirely. Drew Timmy, 8 of 9 from the free throw line. He is fantastic, has always been fantastic at drawing contact in the paint. His ability to get his arms underneath players, finish through contact, or at the very least draw that contact and get to the free throw line remains incredible, but he has not been converting Uh, against Washington. He made his first four. The commentators were kind of saying, oh, look, you know, he's kind of turned a corner. And then I think he finished that game six of 11, missed the next four or five in a row. That did not happen in this game. Eight of nine from the free throw line. Like I said, he also had six boards, three assists and a steal. Really, really nice all around performance from him. After that, Any good performances that we're really going to talk about in this game didn't come from any of the starters. Anton Watson had a fine game. He was not particularly special, uh, did what Anton Watson does in this game. I don't want to, you know, downgrade what he did too much, but it wasn't a particularly great game from him either. Uh, But after that, the rest of the starters, oof. It was not a good game from Gonzaga starting guards. And and unfortunately, that has become a theme for this team right now is that those guys are just not playing well. Nolan Hickman, five points, four assists, two of seven shooting. Not awful, not great, better than Gonzaga's other guards in this one, unfortunately. Julian Strother, it has been really tough to see him not appear in every single game. This is one of the biggest things that I believe Gonzaga was counting on coming into the season is consistent, reliable secondary scoring from Julian Strother as the number two option behind Drew Timmy. He has not been that. He has been that at times, but he has not been that consistently. Four points and two rebounds in this game. Four points, two rebounds against a team that, again, outside the top 300 in Ken Palm, outside it in defense. There's just, there's no reason that this game should have been a challenge for any of Gonzaga's starting guards. Four points, two assists, 
or excuse me, two rebounds. He played 17 minutes, which tells me like a lot of people are, are clamoring for Mark Few to start making some changes. He has. To be clear, he has already done that. He has not changed the starting lineup, and that is, you know, something that I think we're going to potentially see coming down the line if things don't change here. But in this game, Julian Strother played 17 minutes. Hunter Salas played 30. That is a change. That is different than what Gonzaga has been doing. That did not happen because of garbage time. Oh, we're just going to let Hunt play the last five or six minutes because, you know, we're already the game's already in hand. Yeah, that did happen, but that is not why Hunter Salas played 13 more minutes in this game than Julian Strother. It happened because Hunter Salas was better, better basketball player than Julian Strother in this game. He had 10 points, two rebounds, two assists. He was four or five from the field. All around better defensively, better offensively, better shot selection, knock down more shots. Every single aspect of this game, Hunter Salas was better. And I'm picking on Julian, but you know what? Rasir Bolton wasn't any better. Rasir Bolton, five points, one of seven shooting in this game. Uh, he, he looked a little better hunting his shot, being more aggressive, trying to find open looks, which I appreciated. That's something that we haven't really seen from him. He's been tentative. But he's not knocking him down. Three of five from the free throw line, that's a tiny sample size. But this is a 90% three-point free throw shooter who's going 60% in this game, who's not making his threes, who's not making any of his shots. Uh, in this game, starters not named Drew Timmy and Anton Watson. One of 10 from three, five of 20 from the field. They are just not getting it done. Now, there were some other still positives from this game. Uh, we mentioned Hunter Salas, fantastic fantastic performance in every aspect of the game. He has been on an absolute tear the last couple of games while Gonzaga's starters haven't really stepped up in this kind of easier stretch of the schedule that they've had against Kent State, against Washington, now against Northern Illinois. Hunter Salas has been good in all three of those games. He remains fantastic. And then Malachi Smith. What a fantastic performance for Malachi Smith. Uh, stepped up in a big way off the bench. None of Gonzaga's guards seemed to really have any interest or ability in, in making an offensive impact in this game. So Smith stepped up 14.6 boards, three assists, four of six from deep. I want to reiterate, the Gonzaga's three starters in the backcourt in this game, one of 10 from three, Malachi Smith, four of six. Not going to happen every game, and there has been some some criticism of Malachi and his ability to step up in big games. We saw that he kind of curbed that with a nice performance against Baylor. Now seeing him do this here again against a, a team that, you know, is the more of the level that he played in his previous college career at Chattanooga, but still to see him step up in a big way, come off the bench, hit shots immediately, make an impact defensively was really, really critical for the Zags. I think, there is more negatives than positives coming out of this game, unfortunately. Uh, but again, for Gonzaga, they only had six turnovers. Six turnovers total. They had six turnovers in the first four minutes against the University of Washington. A significantly better defensive team, but regardless, to come back out in this game, only turn the ball over six times. And we mentioned Drew Timmy going eight of nine from the free throw line. Well, the Zags as a team went 18 of 21 absolutely fantastic 85 percent from the free throw line very strange that two of the three misses for the entire team were from Rasir Bolton far far and away their best free throw shooter by percentage an oddity probably not something that's going to continue to happen uh, for Rasir Bolton but still really nice to see the Zags as a team shoot really really well from deep but we didn't even get to talk about another big story in this game, which was the massive emergence of Ben Gregg and some nice minutes from Efton Reed as well. We're going to talk much more about that in the second segment. But before we do that, today's episode of Locked on Zags is brought to you by Omaha Steaks. The holidays are here. Achieving gifting greatness when you give the perfect gift of aged, tender, and delicious Omaha Steaks. Omaha Steaks is an American original butcher since 1917 and a holiday gift that's guaranteed to be loved. The steak experts at Omaha Steaks have put together special curated gift packages to help take the guesswork out of gifting and make you a holiday hero. Go to omahasteaks.com and use code Locked On at checkout to get $30 off your order. Set an assortment of mouthwatering favorites guaranteed to impress like the legendary butcher's cut filet mignon, air chilled boneless chicken, ultra juicy burgers, and even easy to prepare comfort meals that are ready in a flash. Omaha Steaks is ready to ship your order right away, so shop early and beat the shipping rush. Omaha Steaks is a gift from the heart, a gift that will be remembered with every unforgettable bite. Order with complete confidence today, knowing you're ordering the very best. Visit omahasteaks.com, use promo code Locked On at checkout to get that extra $30 off your order. A minimum order may be requ required. 
All right, segment two, still any patents, still Locked On Zags. Want to thank all of you for making Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. For your second listen today, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights that only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports Today, available on this app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. All right, we want to talk about my five things to watch Coming into this game, I did that on Monday's episode for those of you who missed it. I have been doing it as a pre-game activity throughout the season. Five things to watch, either five keys to victory, depending on the opponent, or more just like what I'm going to be watching in the game. I like to recap them after the game to see how much of an impact these things actually made in the game. The number one key in this contest, unfortunately, was no slow starts. Well... (laughs) That has been an issue for Gonzaga all year, and you'd think, you'd hope, at least, that against this kind of opponent that they wouldn't kind of succumb to that, and that just wasn't the case. Six to four at the first media timeout. Zags only had eight points over eight minutes into the game. Uh, They did go on a nice little run and get up 16 to six at one point, and I thought, okay, well, you know what? Maybe... Maybe we can consider it a bit of a slow start, but hey, at least they finally had their nice little run. Now they're up 16 to six. It's not going to be a problem. Nope, that was not the case. Unfortunately, after that, Gonzaga kind of just never really put this team away until the last like seven or eight minutes of the game. Even then is maybe more like five or six minutes of the game before they really finally just cemented a victory here. And so shout out to Northern Illinois. They had two players who had really, really nice games, Williams and Crump. I think both scored over 20 points. Crump was averaging three and a half points per game, came out and dropped 20 Kudos. Some guys play really well in the bright lights and play really well in games that uh, they're, you know, against opponents like this, the guys step up and play well. Hats off there. But at the same time, you got to bury teams like this. You have to have to have, you cannot be up six. You can't only score 36 points in the first half against a team like this. You just can't. This team's slow starts are absolutely killing them. And again, at some point you have to consider whether it's a change you need to make to the starting lineup. If the starters are clearly not get the starters clearly got outperformed by the backups in this game. And that hasn't happened every game. And there's some consistency issues with the backups as well. It's easy to look at Malachi Smith and Hunter Salas and think, well, these guys haven't been inconsistent all year. Yeah, they have. They haven't, they haven't, nobody has been cons- super consistent. That's why it's been such a tough year, but yeah, at some point you got to look at the recent performances of Bolton, the recent performances of Strother, the recent performances of Salas and Smith and think, well, what, 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 what gives here? What, what maybe needs to change? Uh, the next key that I had in the game was big performances from the transfers. We talked a lot about Malachi Smith already in the first segment, 22 minutes, 14 points, five of 10 shooting four of six from deep. So it wasn't super efficient around the rim, whatever. <laughs> it's nitpicking his performance in this one, six boards, three assists and a steal. Really, really nice all around performance from him. Took the right shots, knocked them down at key times, uh, played well on defense. And then Efton Reed got some minutes in this one as well. Only seven minutes in this game. Didn't score. His box score doesn't look overly impressive. Zero points, two rebounds, an assist, and a block. I think he was 0 of 2 from the field. But honestly, I thought he gave the Zags some good minutes. He's a high energy guy. He's a big, big freaking dude. You can tell as soon as he gets on the court because of how big he is. Uh, His block was a really emphatic block, really nice defense. Defense, kept his arms up, didn't commit a foul there, had a really nice assist to Ben Gregg that really was kind of a highlight real play in the first half. Uh, we didn't see him much in the second half. In fact, I don't think we saw him all in the second half, uh, but I thought this was a nice, another nice, quiet, but, but productive performance from Efton Reed. Now, the reason that we didn't see Efton Reed in the second half and the big thing that uh, it's kind of surprising that we're about 14 minutes into this episode and haven't talked about this yet, but what a performance from Ben Gregg. My goodness. Ben Gregg was out in full effect. The third key I had in this game was a bounce back from Ben Gregg. Boy, howdy, did we get that here in this one. 18 points, a tremendous career high for Ben Gregg. Easily a career high for for the Portland native. Uh, 18 points, seven boards, three steals, one assist. 18 and seven, that is you average those numbers, you're, you're an all-time great. <laughs> that is fantastic performance. 18 and 7, that's basically Philip Petrusev in his season where he was, uh, you know, WCC Player of the Year, I believe, one of the best players in the conference. Uh, that was a, a fantastic performance from Ben to do that coming off the bench. 6 of 11 from the field, only 1 of 2 from deep, which I think is actually a, a, a productive thing that – the the scouting report on Ben the knock or the the what people have said about Ben is that he's a pure outside shooter, that is his game. He's a stretch four, and yes, that is a big part of his game. But it's not all of his game. In this game, he took most of his shots around the rim, five of nine 
around the rim, five of five from the free throw line for Ben. He was, you know, down in the block. He was posting guys up. He was hitting mid range shots. He was pump faking on threes, driving to the basket and hitting little floaters like that. That kind of stuff is, is a maturity that we have not seen from Ben at all throughout his career. He's still very young. He hasn't really cracked into the rotation except for the last three weeks or so. So we're really just just scratching the surface of who Ben Gregg is, what he is able to bring to this team. But when you can drop 18 and 7 in a game where most of Gonzaga's players didn't play particularly well, I mean, that's really, really notable for him to be able to do that. And I'm very excited to see what he can continue to do. And again, we mentioned Efton Reed had a solid performance, but if Ben's going to do stuff like this, and Drew is, of course, going to continue to be Drew, and Anton continues to provide really valuable minutes as a defensive player, it's going to be hard for Efton to keep playing this year. And I think that's fine. I think it's okay for him to have more of a development year, but a lot of this is, is not that Efton has been playing bad the last couple of minutes that we've seen from him. It's that Ben Gregg has played fantastic. A uh, fourth key that I mentioned here is whether Rasir Bolton will hunt his own shot, which is a, an interesting key because Rasir Bolton did not have a good game. One of seven from the field, O of three from deep three of five from the free throw line, which I already mentioned. But what we did see from Rasir Bolden was more aggressiveness trying to get to the rim. And I did appreciate that because throughout the season, Rasir has kind of been notably absent for a lot of Gonzaga's games. He, he's been maybe a standstill shooter when he gets wide open looks, when Gonzaga is able to get the opposing defense in a switching hell where they're all, everybody's is behind the sticks a little bit. They swing the ball around. Rasir gets an open three, shoots it. We've seen him have that offense. But we haven't seen much else. A big part of it is Gonzaga's just unwillingness and, and inability to get out in transition. Such a huge part of last year's team, in tremendous part due to Andrew Nemhard, but also because of Chet Holmgren. And I don't think that that aspect necessarily gets talked about enough. Nemhard was a fantastic at getting out in transition and, and getting open looks and finding open guys and doing that whole thing. But what Chet brought is the ability to not necessarily have to dive and crash for defensive rebounds. You could have more guys kind of slip out and try to get out in transition ahead of time because the seven foot guy with the seven foot nine wingspan is going to get all of the rebounds. Chet's ability to get a rebound turn and immediately make an outlet pass and or put the ball on the deck and just start going that was a huge skill set of his that amidst a tremendous amount of skill sets that Chet already displayed it was kind of one that didn't necessarily get talked about all of that much but you know it was, it was, a, it was a strength of Kevin Loves that was a huge part of his career is still a big part of his career is the ability to rebound turn get out in transition immediately Zags don't really have that right now you can see multiple plays where they attempt to get out in transition and just get stopped and at first it was kind of, oh, this is probably just caliber of opponents, but it's not. They're, they're not able to get out in transition as effectively. That is impacting Rasir Bolton. That is where a lot of his points came from. He was more aggressive this game at, at trying to get to the rim. We saw him attack the rim. He got an and one to start the second half. It was a nice possession. Uh, but ultimately, seven shots from the field. I don't hate that, uh, but he only made one of them. But that I do hate. That is a problem for Rasir. And it's it's in the midst of, of a pretty ugly stretch of basketball from him. He's a veteran guy. He's done this for many years. He has been consistently good every year he's been in college. I don't think that Rasir Bolton has just cratered. I don't think that his performance is gone. I think he is adjusting to figuring out his role this year, which is a little bit, I guess, confusing because I don't think of, of all of Gonzaga's players, I think his role has probably changed the least but that is just from an outsider's perspective I don't know what Mark Few and the staff is telling him I don't know if they have adjusted their expectations for him they want him to do things a little bit differently it's hard to tell but we haven't quite seen that Rasir Bolton that we saw at times last year I think he's going to show up and I think it's going to be hopefully at a really nice time for Gonzaga like maybe Saturday morning against the Alabama Crimson Tide would be a really nice time for Rasir to have a, a bounce back productive game uh, but right now he He's struggling, and it's impacting Gonzaga in a pretty significant way. Last key of the game is one that I would hoped we would have seen, but we didn't really get to, uh, which is just seeing the non-rotation guys. It's always fun to get a chance to see some of those guys play in, in games when uh, you hope that the score is well long determined earlier in the game. Uh, it took a little longer for Gonzaga to get to that point, and when, when that happens, Mark Few tends to be less willing to play some of the backup guys. The only real non-rotation guy we saw in this game, depending whether you consider Efton Reed a rotation guy, I suppose. But the only other one was Dominic Harris. He came in in the final two minutes, had a really nice pass to Ben Gregg for a lay-in. That was it. 
Uh, nothing against Dom's performance. He just did, he didn't do all that much because it was the last two minutes of a game against a team where the Zags already had a 20 point lead. So there just wasn't, there's not really a whole lot you can do in those minutes. Of course, I, it would have been nice to see Colby Brooks, would have been nice to see A. Beagle or Joe Few. Uh, I, I again suspect we're not going to see any of Braden Huff or Caden Perry this season uh, just because of injuries and red shirting for, for in Huff's situation at least. But uh, good to see Dom get out on the court a little bit. But again, not really enough to really glean any information about him. Him and, and his status from this performance. All right, folks, we're going to close out the show talking about Zags in the NBA. We got four guys that we're going to focus on, including a couple of guys who are posting career numbers this season. But before we do that, I want to tell you all about Built Bar. For anyone who hasn't tried Built's new bars before, they are literally the best tasting protein bars ever built. They're revolutionizing nutrition as we know it with 100% real chocolate, 17 grams of protein, and shockingly low sugar and calories. 130 calories, that's it. Just sink your teeth into the first bite and it'll change your life forever. I am not kidding. There will be a time before you try the new Built flavors and the magical, wonderful time afterwards. Built has five new holiday flavors to choose from. Cookie dough topper, coconut brownie bar, coconut brownie topper, white chocolate peppermint granola, and candy cane brownie. You're probably wondering which new flavor is my favorite and unanswerable question to say the least. They're all unbelievable and they're all different. So you can order a mixed box right now and try all five flavors for yourself. Built, you gotta try it. You can get 15% off your order right now by using the code LOCKEDON15 at built.com. That's LOCKEDON15 at built.com to get 15% off your order. All right, segment three, still any patents, still Locked on Zags. We're going to pivot away from talking about the Northern Illinois game, and we're going to look more at some Zags in the NBA. We got more talk about Gonzaga's starting lineup, some of that other stuff that came out of this game coming in later episodes. But right now, want to focus on four particular Gonzaga alumni in the past. Zags in the um, and, and excuse me, Zags in the NBA segments have been the ability to go over all of the Zags in the NBA in one eight-minute segment. We just don't have the ability to do that anymore because of how many Zags are playing professional basketball right now. It is a tremendous testament to Mark Few and the development staff to have this many dudes playing league basketball right now. Uh, we talked a lot about Andrew Nempard last week, and go back and listen if you haven't yet because his performances, uh, hitting a game winner against LeBron James, cooking Steph Curry for 31 points and 13 assists absolutely deserving of another listen if you missed it but today we're focused on a couple other zags the first guy that i want to talk about is a zag who gets less attention as an nba player than many other ones in part because of serious serious injury issues that has hampered his career up to this point that is zach collins backup center for the san antonio spurs zach collins is having a career season he is playing the best basketball of his NBA career right now under coach Greg Popovich and the San Antonio Spurs. He's averaging 8.6 points, 5.8 rebounds, 2.8 assists while playing just under 21 minutes per game. That is a career high in points, a career high in assists. He is also posting a career high in blocks at 0.9 per game, career high in field goal percentage at 52.2%, and a career high in two-point field goal percentage at 62.8%. It is so fantastic to see Zach playing well after all the injuries. Of course, he was with the Portland Trailblazers, top lottery pick for them, played well in a, in a kind of a bit role, stepped into a starting role, got hurt four games into the season that ended up being the bubble season, didn't play until the bubble, which is about a year later, only played eight games there, then missed the entire rest of the next season with ankle injuries, missed the part of the next season, which was with San Antonio, played well down the stretch with the Spurs last year. Now he's here, he's healthy. He's playing some really good basketball for San Antonio and just really good to see for a, a, an all-around good zag. Yeah, he was only there for a year, but he helped lead the team to a dang national championship appearance. And it's nice to see him playing good, healthy basketball uh, at the next level. Next up, Rui Hachimura. Unfortunately, not talking about playing healthy basketball right now. Rui is listed as being week to week with an ankle injury. You, you Day to day doesn't sound so bad. Week to week, not so good. Uh, his last game was November 18th, so he's already been out for about a month. Uh, still week to week with that ankle injury. Hopefully he will be back soon. Obviously missed a lot of basketball last year with personal issues, with some mental health issues, likely uh, related to his role in the Olympics for Japan and, and the pressure that he felt there. Uh, Brewey has been very solid when he has played this year. 11 and a half points, just under five rebounds and about an assist per game. 
Hopefully, again, he will return to the court soon and get a chance to play alongside his former teammate and current teammate in Washington. That is Corey Kispert. Uh, Corey has been very, very solid this year with Washington. He has emerged as one of their better contributors, one of their more significant players. He's played 20 games so far with the Wizards. 13 of them have been starts. So again, he is basically a starting player for Washington at this point, and he's playing just over 28 minutes per game. That is starting level minutes, 28, 30 minutes. That's like, that's right on line with, with like top five players on the team. So it's really nice to see Corey be a central part of what this Washington team is trying to do this year. He's averaging nine and a half points, 2.7 boards, 1.7 assists. He is shooting just under 62% on two point shots, which is fantastic ability to get to the rim, to finish around contact, to hit mid range shots. You know, Corey was kind of labeled as a, as a three point shooter only coming out of college, and certainly that is his best skill set, and he's shooting 40.7% from deep, so he is demonstrating that that is a critical skill for him as an NBA player, but he is more than that. He has more ability. He's still struggling a bit on the defensive end of the floor, but offensively, he can get to the rim. He's a good passer. He's a skilled rebounder. I think he's starting to demonstrate that he is more than just a three-point shooter, and that's great news for Corey. It's also great news for Washington, who got themselves a really nice piece with the 15th pick in the draft a couple of years ago. And we're closing out the show talking about the recent inductee to Gonzaga. It's not really a ring of honor. I'm not sure what they call it. His jersey is being hung up, has been hung up in the rafters at the McCarthy Athletic Center. That is, of course, the big one three, Kelly Olenek, who has had a luxurious, lengthy 10 plus year NBA career now with the Utah Jazz. I uh, started out the season really hot. Utah did. They're now just 15 and 14. So it'll be interesting to see if they continue to kind of slide out of playoff contention, if they ultimately look to, to do some more selling and trading some veteran guys for, for younger pieces or future draft picks to kind of build a future roster around. That likely would not include Kelly Linux. So it is very possible that his time in Utah is potentially numbered as in he might be traded as soon as February. I haven't looked at all of his contract details, but I assume Utah would not have acquired him unless they had the ability to trade him at the deadline, because that is kind of what it seems like is their likely plan, barring uh, another really hot stretch of basketball from Utah and the ability to potentially contend for a playoff spot. Uh, Kelly's played fantastic this year. I've, whenever I talk about Kelly Linick on the podcast, I'd like to mention how he has been remarkably consistent for his NBA career, averaging roughly 10 points and roughly five rebounds per game he's done that for basically a decade he's had some notable counter examples his performance with the houston rockets at the after he got traded to them a couple years ago was incredibly it was like 18 points and 12 rebounds he was fantastic he wasn't as good with detroit last year in part because he was dealing with some injury stuff and, and frankly because detroit didn't really know how to utilize him on the basketball court well utah does Utah is utilizing him the correct way. He's having a really nice season for the Jazz. 13 and a half points per game, five rebounds, 3.3 assists. The assist numbers are up from his usual numbers. 13 points is a little higher. The five boards is about right for Kelly. That's what he's averaged throughout his career. He is also shooting 61% on two-pointers, and he is shooting 45% from deep 45% from three career high for Kelly. He is an absolute lockdown shooter right now. Seven foot guy who can knock down 45% of his threes. Who wouldn't want that on their NBA roster? Yeah. He's a bit limited defensively. Yeah. He's a bit injury prone, but my goodness, if you are a contending team and you are looking at your team, how many teams that are contending have a guy like that? And even if you do, why not have more than one? Why not trade for another guy who can do what he can do? He can stretch the floor. He can go get some rebounds. He's not, again, he's not useless defensively. He's a big body. He's, he's physical. He's athletic. He can keep guys in front of him, play decent on that end of the floor. But you're trading for him for his offense. The 45% shooting. He had a really nice Kelly Olynyk esque move in one of his recent games where he slipped underneath a defender, extended his arm for a little finger roll. It was reminiscent of what he did during that 2012 2013 season. Nice to see him getting back to his roots a little bit while still shooting the absolute crap out of the ball from beyond the arc. All right, that is going to do it for me today. Don't forget to check out the new podcast, Locked On College Basketball, where myself and Isaac Shade of Locked On Tar Heels break down the biggest stories in college hoops. Uh, stay tuned for more here on Locked On Zags as well. Available wherever you get podcasts, also available on YouTube. If you haven't done so yet, hit that subscribe button, not only for Locked On Zags, but for Locked On College Basketball as well. Finally, I want to thank all of you for making Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. For your next listen, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast, the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, 
and the take of the day available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. All right, folks, thank you all for listening and go Zags.